Sir, may I come in? Please come. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Please sit down. Thank you, sir. What is your name? Uh, sir, my name is Ricky Lohokar Pradhan. If we call you Ricky, is that okay? Yes, sir. Oh, very nice. So, Mr. Ricky, please tell us about yourself. Uh, sir, uh, I'm Ricky Lohokar Pradhan. I come from Guwahati, Assam. I did my uh, schooling in Don Bosco School, following which I did my uh, manufacturing engineering from Bitspilani. I worked for a year for Slumberjay in the oil and gas sector. After that, I did a master's in English literature from St. Stephen's College. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm working now as an inspector of taxes for the Assam government. I'll be moving into a uh, superintendent of taxes in the Assam government from March 1st. Please sit, relax. Let yes, your sir. back touch the back of the chair. You have twice gone to UPSC in the past. Uh, sir, it's actually once. Once, okay. How yeah. many marks you got when you went? Uh, 179, sir. Okay. Tell us the tell us the overview of Assam since independence. Sir, since independence. Okay. Yes. Sir, since independence, Assam has been mainly known for its tea, for its uh, oil and gas, and most importantly because of its culture in being a site for the Kamakya Temple as well as for its Bihu festival. Uh, besides that. There has been also issues of uh, insurgency in Assam because of which it was less famous. And uh, over the past couple of years, there has been a rapid push towards leveraging the economy of Assam by connecting it to the Southeast Asia, as well as improving the manufacturing base of Assam as well. Well, your father is a professor of, uh, in the pharma field. Tell me, why India is called the pharmacy <coughs> world? Uh, India is called pharmacy of the world because it's huge generic drugs export, especially to countries like uh, South Africa and other African countries and also to countries like USA. This was very evident during the time of COVID when India adopted a vaccine metri policy and supplied vaccines to several countries that needed it during that time, sir. Any other reason? Sir, it is also a huge in terms of production of uh, vaccines, sir. And also, uh, since you have asked it, sir, it's also because India is home to Ayurveda as well, sir. So that's another trend. You mean Ayurvedic medicines are also exported quite a lot? Sir, I'll have to look on that, sir. But I was saying from the cultural aspect in the sense that Ayurveda is also one of the famous aspects of Indian medicine. Okay. What is the news from Manipur today? You may have read it in the newspapers. Yes, sir. Sir, the news from Manipur today is that the uh, court, the judiciary, which initially said that the... Which court? The Manipur High Court. Okay. Which said that the uh, scheduled tribe should also include the Métis, that is being corrected now and it is no longer being considered to be included. They said it? Yes, sir. That it should be corrected? Yes, sir. I mean, was it a verbal observation? Was it a written order? What, the, what, what was it? Sir, I'll have to check on the details of that, sir. You're not aware of it? I'm not aware beyond that, sir. And earlier the High Court had said that Mehti should be included. Yes, sir. Hmm. Tell me, uh, China and India were at the same level of development in 1980s. And then China outstripped India. And now its economy is five, six times that of uh, India now. It's a big joint today. What happened? What he did and what they, we didn't do? Sir, China opened up its economy around 1990s onwards, sir. It had uh, leveraged a lot of... 1990s, we opened up. Yes, yeah. sir, we also opened up, but we still had restrictions in our economy as well, sir, in terms of labor laws, in terms of scalability of uh, special economic zones. So, China mainly become a really big giant as we know it today is because of how it leveraged on the manufacturing supply chains for the world, sir. There was a huge scale in which manufacturing plants were opened up. There were very cheap labor costs and a lot of investment in infrastructure by China, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Ricky, please give us an overview of the Indian economy. Sir, the Indian economy, sir, right now it's doing good, sir. The growth rate that has been going for past some time now, it's around 7, 7.5, seven sir. And it is projected to be 
this way for the next few years as well, sir. This is in line with Indian economy trying to become uh, a developed nation by 2047, sir. So, what are the drivers of growth? So, there are several drivers of growth. In Indian economy, the biggest growing sector is the services sector. However, right now there is a push towards the manufacturing sector as well through the PLI scheme, the Make in India scheme, sir. Is that all? Overview of the Indian economy? Sir, there is more to with it. Growth. Sir, no, there is more to it, sir. Please go on then. Sir, there is a push towards trying to increase consumption as well. The government is heavily investing in capital expenditure. It has grown at 11% as per the latest budget. So the government is also hoping that the private sector now will step in to boost their investment so that the country's growth can be accelerated, sir. Why is it not stepping in so far? Sir, it is not stepping in so far because the consumption level is a little, uh, I would say, down and they don't want to take that risk as of now. There is a push right now, but they are trying to see whether they can step in right now or not, sir. Tell us about the takeaways from the interim budget. Sir, the interim budget is one which uh, highlighted that India's growth did not come at the cost of fiscal deficit ballooning up, sir. The fiscal deficit uh, was much better than what was expected. It came down to 5.1% instead of 5.9%. Uh, this is highlighted that it is not due to cutting in expenditure but increase in revenue for the government, especially in terms of tax collections. The direct tax collection has shot up beyond the indirect tax collection this time, which is very good for the economy. That's it. Sir. Uh, yes. Okay. Now tell us, uh, what is the level of poverty in India? Sir, uh, the level of poverty as per the official estimates of the Tendulkar committee, it's around 22%. However, the recent uh, multidimensional poverty index by Niti Aayog, it says it has come down to 15%, sir. That's it? Sir. <laughs> sir, I mean... Okay, other than Niti Aayog, yes, sir. the UNDP also came up with a figure. Uh, okay, sir. And... Uh, what do you understand by multidimensional poverty? Sir, multidimensional poverty captures the subjective aspect of poverty beyond just an income criteria. For example, the multidimensional poverty indicator, it highlights on health, education, as well as living standards like access to drinking water and sanitation. Each one of them has uh, one third weightage, health, education, and living standards also has one third weightage in total, sir. My last question. What do you know about illicit drugs? Sir, illicit drugs are a bane for the country in general. Give me some examples. Sir, uh, some of the illicit drugs would be, sir, cannabis, heroin, meth. These are some of the drugs which are illicit in the country, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, Mr. Ricky. Hello, sir. Uh, I see that you have been a keen cricketer that you won the gold medal or whatever in the inter-college cricket. That was it here in Delhi? Uh, sir, it was in Pilani, sir. Pilani, Bil yes, sir. Pilani, okay. Because you studied here also later. Uh, yes, sir. In Stevens. Now, there are three positions in cricket. Silly mid-on, silly mid-off, silly point. Yes, sir. Why are they silly? Sir, because you are very close to the batsman, sir. So? So it's called silly because you can get hit as a fielder. You can get hurt. Yes, sir. The fielder can get hurt. Yes, sir. Uh, you also got an award. The, what's the long list short story writing competition? Yes, sir. So what is the long list? Sir, a long list. That means you were included in it's not shortlisted. Yeah, it's not shortlisted. It's a long listed. And your story was the half and one. Yes, sir. What was the story? Sir, the story is uh, not half and one, sir. The journal's or the event's name was uh, half and one. My story's name was called The Broken Window. The Broken Window? Yes, sir. In a nutshell, what was it about? Sir, it's basically based on a real event that took place in Guwahati. There was a India versus uh, Australia T20 match. India lost the match and someone thought it was a good idea to vent his frustration by breaking the Australian cricket team's glass, uh, buses glass. It became a huge issue at that point of time and uh, Actually, yeah, I'm it was really a bad thing that happened. 
But the story is from a different perspective. It tries to be very sympathetic and tries to say from the narrator, who is the person who broke in the window, why he did it, why he did it, and why it is right. By the time you finish the story, it's a pretty long one. It's beyond five thousand words. Oh, it's not a short story. Yeah, it's not a short story at all, sir. It it goes beyond that. I believe the reader would be convinced that whatever the person did was not right. That wrong. Yeah, Bro breaking a window. Just because you've lost a cricket match. Yeah. Okay. Now, tell me, uh, you follow the newspapers. Tell me uh, three important news items from today's papers pertaining to international affairs. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, firstly, it would be that, uh, sir, international Correct. relations. Not domestic, but India's okay. foreign policy or international affairs. So, the first would be the ongoing... Uh, Israel versus Hamas conflict so going what is on. The news item? And uh, the Hamas leadership has said that Israel is not willing on any negotiations and it has continued to attack on this uh, city called Rafa, if I'm pronouncing it. Rafa. Rafa. Sorry, sir. Second would be the Ukraine and the Russia conflict. And uh, Russia has captured this city a couple of days back, Advika. And Ukraine is still waiting for supplies from uh, the US, which is not happening. Thirdly, I would say the ongoing Raisna dialogues in Delhi, where all the international uh, representatives come and they are having a discussion on how uh, to set the world order correctly, sir, now. All right. Now, they say that foreign policy is based on national interests. Yes, sir. What national interests of India are in included or they are factored in while we design foreign policy? Sir, one of the most important factors that comes to my mind while we say national interest is the welfare of the citizens, sir, in foreign policy. For example, when uh, the Ukraine and Russia conflict broke out, India, despite the sanctions given by West on Russia, decided to import Russian oil at a cheaper rate. And India's defense for it was that it had to ensure that inflation could not go beyond a point so that prices in India is controlled. So this is one way in which India's foreign policy ensured that the welfare of the citizens were ensured. And other factors? Yes, sir. There are other factors to it as well. It's also ensuring the uh, sovereignty and the territorial integrity of India. Post Galwan crisis, India had increased its presence, military presence in the northern and the northeast, uh, eastern border with China. And recently there is a plan to form a new corps in the middle of middle LAC so that it provides an effective deterrence to China and inhibits any such aggression in the future. Anything else? Sir, uh, the third would be uh, in terms of natural, in, uh, sorry, national interest. An aspect would be to ensure that India emerges a global superpower, has a strong voice in the world fora, so that it can take up issues for its neighborhood and its uh, allies as well. Okay. Anything else? Sir, I'm not able to think right. that. Now, India had the G20 presidency last year. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think were the main achievements of our presidency? Sir, the main uh, achievements of our presidency would be the firstly the New Delhi Declaration where it had not explicitly mentioned uh, the role of Russia in the Ukraine crisis and it was a diplomatic victory for India because it was seen as a balancing force between the West and the Russia axis as well. The second achievement would be its uh, role in being a voice of Global South by the inclusion of African Union into the G20. My last question. Suppose you were taken into the foreign service. Yes, sir. And you had to go on a posting to one of our neighboring countries. Yes, sir. Which one would you choose? Sir, I would choose to go to Bangladesh, sir. Now, what are the problems in India's relations with Bangladesh? Sir, one of the main issues of India's uh, India-Bangladesh relations is the issue of uh, illegal immigration that happens from Bangladesh because of flooding and other issues there, the consequent NRC and the CA that came up. Sir, the second issue is, is the fallout of this is the issue of radicalism spreading in Northeast because of this illegal immigration. In Assam, we have bases of this group called uh, Ansari Bangla that has been detected in the past couple of years because of this. The third issue would be the, uh, the river sharing disputes which we have 
with uh, Bangladesh and the Tista Water Treaty, which resolved, which was not resolved. These are the three uh, pain points I would say with Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ricky, yes, sir. you have interest in cricket. Yes, sir. There is a saying that a captain is as good as his team. Yes, sir. Do you agree? Yes, sir. So why have a captain? Why put so much emphasis that captain is very important? Sir, the captain is very important because he is needed, he or she is needed to lift the spirits of the team when it is down and to marshal his players in the in a way that it functions as a unit, as a total unit and gives a bird eye picture to the events going on. I'd like to draw an example. In the 2011 World Cup, where India was successful in winning the World Cup, Mahindra Singh Dhoni's first 50 was the one he played in the final match. Before that, he did not score a single 50. I think he scored only one 50, but his performance as a batsman was not very stellar, as he's known for. But his contribution mainly was towards how he managed everyone in the team and got victory to India. Okay. All right. So, you know, coalition government. Yes, sir. Versus one party government. Yes, sir. Which is your uh, uh, most uh, appropriate government for India today? Sir, I would say for India, uh, the coalition government is more appropriate because it uh, gives uh, views to the lot of regional diversity which we have and gives voice to these issues as well. But say, look at the contradiction, say in Assam. Yes, sir. All parties, they fight the election. Yes, sir. And after the election, they all come together. Yes, sir. Isn't it uh, 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 somehow you are not uh, being honest to the mandate? Yes, sir. During the election, you fight. Yes, sir. But because you want to enjoy the power, you all come together. Sir, this is definitely one issue to look up, but because it's a democracy, sir, things have to be resolved through dialogue and discussion. And I believe this contradiction will be resolved in the years to come when India, both as a electorate as well as the political parties, begin to mature and have more uh, robust. So, tell me, what is the shortcomings of coalition government? The shortcomings of coalition governments are like you mentioned, that they basically would give an indication they don't have any ideologies where they adhere to. They form coalitions based on necessity and not ideologies. So this is one issue. And sometimes in coalition governments, they may go against the mandate of people when for which they might have been voted into power. For example, the Assam Gono Parishad, it, it's a it's a very regional party. It's a very local party. It came as a byproduct. But still you support coalition. Yes, I supported coalition because in the larger interest, even though there might be contradictions, it's still keeps the diverse viewpoints across the different regions represented at the national level. All right. Now, Northeast, when this India's look is policy, act is policy started, there was this saying that it will benefit. Yes, sir. Has it benefited? Yes, sir. It Give me some example. Yes, sir. So the activist policy has actually benefited Northeast because of uh, how it is perceiving the Northeast, not as a region that is on the fringe of India, but as a source of connectivity to Southeast Asia as well. So where is the connectivity? Sir, Nothing has worked out. Yes, sir. Sir, some of the connectivity issues that has not been resolved is the Kaladan multimodal uh, transport. It's because of the issues. Yeah, whatever the reason, yes, but sir. it has not worked out. Yes, so sir. So for what various contradictions. Yes, sir. Sir, but uh, it has not worked out. Yes, sir. Sir, I would uh, argue against it also by highlighting some of the connectivity aspects that has been worked out, sir. India has got access to the Chittagong and uh, Mongola port in Bangladesh for her exports, as well as the Agartala Akura rail link to Bangladesh, so that the connectivity between uh, Northeast and West Bengal but it becomes is less. But that uh, due to Actis policy or is because of good relationship between India and Bangladesh? Sir, it's a part of both, sir. I won't say that it's uh, mutually exclusive. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ricky. Our discussion with you is over. Thank you, sir. Please wait outside for a few minutes. We will call you for a feedback. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.